lovely words of that chorus, lose all their guilty stains, and that is what this service is about. Good morning to all. Welcome to our Communion Sunday worship. Person or online, we're glad you could join us. Announcements beyond the routine. Uh, next Saturday, we're going to tackle some projects in the kitchen downstairs. Then Saturday the 29th, our congregational annual meeting. Usual reminder for those responsible for reports, please get them in in time for them to be presented a week in advance. You may have noticed as you came in a card for Bob Strack. You don't know Bob, but you do know our website, and he is the one who's responsible for it, and just a way of saying thank you, so please sign your name there. Epiphany, Greek word meaning shining forth. Now, granted, the man on the street probably won't make much of the first Sunday after the Epiphany. But in language that he would understand, everyday use, and aha moment, yeah, now I get it. That's really the sense of this season of the church year. You could say the gift of God's Son came at Christmas, all wrapped up, and you wouldn't know the wonders to come by just looking at the package. 30 odd years later, the wrappings came off, and John said, Aha! We beheld his glory, glory as of God's only Son, full of grace and truth. Well, that's the season we'll be celebrating in the weeks to come. Psalm 29 speaks of the glory of God. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The, the God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness, shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let's pray. Lord, indeed, we want this morning to give you the glory that's due you, worshiping you in the splendor of your holiness. Help us to do that now in our praise, in our prayer, in our attention to your word. Lord, be with us and with us all your people wherever they are gathered in your name. Help us to praise and thank and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand and sing to his name. <clears throat>
Our epistle reading for today is from Romans 6. In the letter, Paul has just made a point that we are saved by grace through faith, not by our own works of righteousness. And then he poses perhaps the mind on his reader, but certainly a reasonable one. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? The answer, well, we read on. By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from dead, the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Let's pray, beginning with the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh Lord, we thank you for a salvation that doesn't just leave us in our sin, but opens the way for us to walk in newness of life. Lord, give us grace to walk in that way, living for you, for your kingdom. Lord, we pray that for ourselves individually, each one, and for this congregation. Lord, you've said in your word that the unity of your people should, must be a witness to the world. We pray now against forces that threaten to divide your church and so weaken our witness. We pray that you would preserve the precious unity that you've created here in our midst, and we thank you for it. Lord, menaced as we find ourselves now with the pandemic, we pray for your mercy on our families, our communities, our schools, our nation. 
in our world. Lord, we can feel helpless. Keep us reminded of your sufficiency. We prayed earlier with David's words, give us strength for these days and peace. Pray for our government leaders, President, Congress, our Supreme Court justices, our governor. They all need wisdom, integrity to do what's right. And Lord, help us, your people, to afford them the respect that their often their office demands. Lord, we pray for those who are going with your word today, and especially going to where it's difficult or dangerous. Lord, we rejoice with reports that even in those places, your church is growing. Lord, help us to be faithful witnesses where we are and our freedom to live and worship and witness is so great. And Lord, for those now who are dealing with health challenges, you may think especially of Mark and Diane's grandkids, but they might experience your great physician's touch and help us to be faithful in prayer for one another. And now, Lord, open our ears and our hearts to your message, to the kids, to all, all of us. May it do its full work in our hearts. Again, may the Lord give strength to us as people. May the Lord bless us with peace. In Jesus' name. Good morning, children. You know, how many of you kids like hot chocolate? Raise your hand if you like hot chocolate. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you were going to have some hot chocolate out of a mug, which mug would you rather have it out of? This one? Yeah. Or this one? How many would rather have it out of this one? How many would rather have it out of this one? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think I'd want it out of either one because look at the inside of this one. <laughs> it doesn't look so good, does it? No. No. I wouldn't want it out of either one of these mugs. And you know, those mugs are a picture of what it's like when we're sinful. Sometimes we can, everybody can see when we do something wrong. Everybody knows it. Um, we have two little grandchildren. Um, one's name is Luke and he's two years old. The other one is Rosie and she's four years old. Sometimes little Luke, because Rosie's playing with a toy that, she want, that he wants to play with, he'll go over and give her a little swat. Well, Mom and dad, his mom and dad have said, told him, he can't do that. And then he'll say, now Luke, you go apologize to Rosie. And so he'll go over and he'll hug her and say, I'm sorry. But of course, 10 minutes later, he may do it again. <laughs> but I was watching this all taking place one day and I watched Rosie. And Rosie kind of went over and she kind of egged him on. <laughs> And then little Luke swatted her, and guess who got in trouble again? <laughs> little Luke. But Rosie was behind it. And you know, that's kind of a picture of sometimes our sins, we can see them, everybody knows them, we know we did wrong. But we have sins in our heart, too. Sins that nobody knows about. And those sins are just as wrong as those that everybody can see. Both are wrong. And we all need the same thing. We all need forgiveness from Jesus. And you know, that's the good thing. That's the good news. Jesus died on the cross so we can be forgiven. So the things that everybody can see that we do that's wrong, they can be forgiven. And the things that are in our own hearts, 
that we know are wrong, even though other people can't see them. They can be forgiven too, because Jesus, he took the punishment that we should have got for our sins when he died on the cross. And so we agree with God that we do wrong, that we commit sins, and we ask God to forgive us. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for us. And you know what? He forgives us and he prepares a home for us. Someday in heaven, we will get to go and be with Jesus forever because he's taking care of our sins. We're going to sing a song now called Hide Me in Your Holiness. Please stand. It was 1979. I was 29 years old. I guess you can figure out how old I am. Um, but it had been a very difficult decade for me. Um, at the beginning of the decade, I had I was in the military. I served a tour of Vietnam, and I came back uh, very discouraged. Um, it was a very bad time for me, and. Um, it didn't get better when I came back. Um, it, uh, I continued a downward spiral throughout that decade until 1979. And in 1979, a friend of mine told me the good news about Jesus' grace and his mercy. And I repented and I believed the gospel and uh, God changed me. He saved me. And my life changed. And I got involved in a little Baptist church up in northern Wisconsin because that was the church that my friend had recommended to me. And um, the pastor of that church was an older man. And um, he began to take me with him when he visited people to tell my story. Well, I began to get very attached to my friend who I was having a Bible study with, he was teaching me, and to the older pastor. And that older pastor was a pretty wise man. He saw what was happening, that I was getting too attached to him. And he said to me, Mark, he said, don't look to me, don't follow me. He says, I have feet of clay, I will let you down. He says, follow Jesus. And that's my thrust of the message today, is Jesus, first, last, and always. Our passage today comes from Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 15. 
As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Father, thank you this morning for your word, and I pray you'll just uh, impress it upon our heart. And we just praise you and thank you that we have your words to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first point that I want to make this morning is that God's people point others to Jesus, never to self. John began his ministry, and we think about A.D. 29, um, a year before Jesus' ministry began. It only lasted for about three years, and the last two of them may have well have been in prison. Now, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for 400 years during what's called the intertestament period. In other words, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, maybe we think it happened right, that the New Testament happened right after the Old Testament, but it didn't. There was a 400 year gap when there was no prophecy in Israel. God was silent. Well, now John the Baptist comes on the scene. And people are flocking to John the Baptist. This is a prophet of God. And from Malachi 3.1, it said that, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. The people believe that, that John was indeed a prophet sent by God. And some thought, maybe John is more John the Baptist is more than a prophet. Maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe he is the Christ. The people were excited. But John downplayed who he was. He said, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. John did not want people to focus on him. John the Baptist wanted people to focus on the Messiah, upon Jesus. Now, when, when uh, John was baptizing earlier in this chapter, he baptized a baptism of repentance, meaning people needed to change their mind about their situation about their sin and then show lives that re that show the, the repentance that were changed in John it says in John chapter 3 and verse uh, number 3 it says he went to all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins but lots of people were coming who weren't repenting they wanted to just get in on the baptism. And he said to those crowds that were coming, he said, you brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. What was John saying? He'd say, you know, I, I'm not going to baptize you just because you're Jews. They were saying, well, we're okay. We're sons of Abraham. We're Jews. We're okay. We want to get in on the baptism. 
John said, bring forth fruit, bring forth lives that show that you've changed. But of course, many didn't. And you know, it's very similar today. Some people think that because they grew up in a Christian home, in a Christian church, they're good. They're good. It's all they need. And attending church or church membership is sort of like joining the Elks or the Rotary or the Kiwanis or something else like that. It's something you add on to your life. But John is telling these people that it's Jesus first, last, and always. And that message has never changed. I mentioned that John never pointed to himself. And he wasn't the only one. Paul had the same situation. People, they do that. You know, there are lots of charismatic leaders out there. And charismatic leaders tend with their personalities to be able to garner a lot of followers. And, and some of those are very godly men. And, and, but even with those, it's hard not to use, for people not to use their personalities to get people attracted to them. And people follow them. And I don't think we, all, we always realize that, but they can focus too much on who that person is and not on who that person is pointing to which is Jesus. Well, that happened in Corinth. And Paul did, dealt with that because there were factions in Corinth where people were following different charismatic type leaders. And he said, he says, one of, each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Then he says these rhetorical questions. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And of course, they were all the answer to all of those was, was no. Paul pointed toward Jesus. And, you know, that's what we want to do here, is point everyone to Jesus. Because that's the job that we've been given. And, you know, that's the job that you've been given too. It's a job that we have all been given is to point people to Jesus. John had said that I baptize with water, but Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire when he comes. And of course, that's exactly what he did. In Acts chapter 1, this is what he told the disciples just before he ascended into heaven. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That command was given not only to the disciples, but it was given to the church, to those following. And it said he would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, and on the day of Pentecost, shortly after he ascended, it says... Tongues of fire appeared to them, to the disciples, and rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Perfectly fulfilling the prophecy that John the Baptist was giving. And then he says to them, he says that Jesus would take the winnowing fork, and he would separate the wheat from the chaff. Well, that's a threshing idea. And the idea was that you would take the fork and you would throw the wheat up in the air. And wheat being heavier would fall straight down. The chaff would catch the wind and would blow into a pile over here. And John says that the wheat, the, the Messiah would gather into his barn. And of course the wheat represents those who repented and believed. That would be gathered into Jesus' barn. Those would be the ones that are saved. But the chaff, he said, would be burned with unquenchable fire. Those who didn't believe. John the Baptist didn't miss, mince words. He had a strong message. And the gist of his message was that he was to point people to Jesus. 
But the second thing was that God's people call out evil. John the Baptist had said in a general way to the crowds that were coming that just wanted to get in on the good thing. He said, you brood of vipers. Mm, that's a pretty serious statement. That's what he said to him. But he talked about Herod and he called out the sins of society. He called out Herod and said, he said that, um, he says that he had been reproved, that he reproved Herod because of Herodias, his brother's wife. Well, what had happened is that Herodias had left his brother and had came to live with Herod Antipas. And he said, that's wrong. And he says, and other evil things that he did, he also called out. Well, this cost a lot to John the Baptist. It cost him one third of his ministry in prison for perhaps as long as two years. Now, Herodias hated John the Baptist for what he said and how he was standing because it was widely known what John the Baptist had said. And she was looking for a way to have him killed. She finally found a way to have him beheaded and killed. And the point, I guess, that we want to make out, say out of this is that sometimes standing against what's right, standing for what's right, excuse me, and against evil may cost. We live in a free country and we have been very fortunate in this country. And we have been able to stand on God's principles and in general terms, it probably hasn't cost us a lot. Not like it has in other countries. But we need to stand, and evil is evil. We stand against abortion because, well, a few weeks ago, I talked about how John the Baptist, when he was in his mother's womb, leaped when Mary showed up with Jesus in her womb. Two people. They are not nothing to just be disposed of because it's inconvenient or because you can't, for whatever reason. So we take a stand against that. I believe that the Bible shows that marriage is between a man and a woman. I'm going to stand on that. There are other things in the Bible. And let me say this. Sometimes the church just moves right along with the world. And if the world says, accepts something, it's not long before the church tends to start to begin to accept it as well. But if we don't stand against the evils of society, and as society continues to its downward spiral, um, there's going to be more and more of that. But if we don't stand as Christians, who will? Who will? So, we are called as Christians not only to point people to Jesus, but to stand. And when we stand, we do it with compassion, with love, with caring. But we stand. My third point is that God's Son is always the focus. Why was Jesus baptized? He didn't have anything to repent of. So why did he accept baptism? Well, Jesus was identifying with sinners. It was a foreshadowing of the judgment that he would face on the cross as he took our place. He is identifying with those who repented and who believed the good news. And when he did that, and this was the beginning the start of his ministry, when the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and the Father spoke from heaven saying, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. That was a public declaration of Jesus' ministry. Now, we know that we don't 
know anything about Jesus' life from the time that he was between 12 and about 30 years old. But we know that when he was in the temple at 12 years old, he was gaining in stature and wisdom with God and with man. And now he was prepared, prepared to begin his ministry. And the Father <coughs> gave his seal of approval upon Jesus. The same terms that are used, the same situation is used later in Jesus' ministry at the Transfiguration when Peter and James and John go up to the mountain with Jesus to see his glory, and they do see his glory. And it says a cloud came and overshadowed them. If you remember, back when Mary was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, it says that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. Here it says that the cloud came and overshadowed them, representative of the Holy Spirit. So we have Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, and again the Father breaks through the heavens and says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. The Trinity. The Trinity is an important concept in the church and a vital concept. And the idea here was that the Father speaks, the Son receives, and the Holy Spirit descends or he overshadows. Well, what's the summary from this passage in Luke? I think it's something that we all can really look to and, and cling to and realize that it implies not just 2,000 years ago, but it applies to us in the church today. John the Baptist pointed the people of Israel to Jesus, never to himself or to any religious institution. That mission has been given to the church, and we are the church. When Luke finishes his gospel in Luke chapter 24, he said this, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. We have that same message today. Repent and believe the gospel. Calling out evil, taking a stand. Taking a stand is something that Christians need to do. Christians have lost their lives over the years. There's a book that was written many years ago called Fox's Book of Martyrs. If you ever get a chance to read that book, it, it delineates how people were, the things that they were subjected to because they refused to recant of their faith, because they refused to, to uh, step back on those things that they were standing for. Christians down through the years, and even today, in some countries, it's costing people their lives <clears throat> to take a stand for Jesus. And never, <clears throat> never do we want to forget that no matter what direction society goes, whatever culture happens to be the norm of the day, our responsibility is to focus our lives on Jesus and to live for and to glorify the one who gave his life for us, Jesus Christ. For he indeed is worthy of all praise. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we sing our song before communion? And remain standing, uh, if you would, for the Apostles' Creed.
Let's end our service with uh, benediction and doxology. Could everybody stand, please? Benediction today is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And our doxology is up there. Oh.